So today we have Latne as our guest, CMO at Six Sense. Um, welcome to the show, Latne. Sammy, thanks for having me. I'm excited oh. to talk to you and all these listeners today. It's a pleasure to have you. Before we get into uh, detailed topics, uh, let me ask some open questions. Uh, where, where are you living? I'm in Chicago, right outside of Chicago in a town called Glenview. Nice. And what do you like to do outside of work? What do I like to do outside of work? I love to hang out with my kids, which is kind of um, there. I have two boys and whatever they like to do, I like to do. And they like to snow ski and they like to water ski. So that's what this old lady does. <laughs> <laughs> Well, are these your, your boys in the background? I see a background picture there. So for the ones seeing the video, mm -hmm. um, you see it. Mm -hmm. That's yep. cool. That was when they were little. Yeah. Ah, now they're taller. Yeah, now they're 12 and, uh, well, no, they're 13 and 14 now. They just both ah. just had birthday. So it must get harder to keep up now with sports. It is. It is. <laughs> Very good. Um, tell me about your company where you're working, Six Sense. What what are you doing? Yeah, so Six Sense um, is just a really amazing um, piece of technology, but it's it's more than a technology. It's really a catalyst for change and helping marketers and sellers um, adopt to modern buyers. And so what do I mean by that? Well, if you think about a buyer today, it's actually not even uh, one person, it's a team, right? So I say, you know, the modern uh, buyer is fragmented across all these different team members with different ideas. Um, they wanna do their research anonymously, right? They don't, they're not gonna fill out a form on your website. Um, they're gonna wait to talk to the salesperson until the end of the cycle. Um, so they're, they're anonymous, they're fragmented. And then the third dynamic about buyers today is they're really like, there's so much noise and they're getting bombarded so much, which creates almost like this vicious cycle of marketers having to do more and having to do more and more noise. And so, you know, when I started in marketing, we thought of a campaign as like eight, eight different touches, right? Today, just a cadence, so just a sales outreach aspect um, of a marketing campaign is, is best practice, they say 22 touches. That's just one small sliver. So I say they're resistant. So the, the, the buyer today is anonymous, fragmented, and resistant. And we have got to really adjust our own game as sales and marketers uh, to over, overcome that and to win. And so that's one of the, that's really what Sixth Sense does is we're an account engagement platform. And so the first thing we're going to do is uncover all of the signals so that whether they're, even when they're doing their research anonymously, you as a, as a marketer or a seller can really understand the research that they're doing. Um, so we, we talk a lot about a dark funnel. You don't have a funnel. A known funnel, you have a dark funnel. And so we want to be able to uncover that. Second is, you know, we're not going to give you leads because a lead is a contact. We're going to give you a qualified account, which means we're going to be looking at the signal across all of these different quote unquote leads or contacts and showing marketers and sellers what a buying team looks like and who is the makeup of that buying team and who on that buying team is engaged, who's not engaged, who needs to be engaged. Um, and then last, we talked about them being resistant. So how do you, how do you make sure you're relevant and you're hitting, hitting your uh, future customers or prospects with a relevant message through the right channel at the right time? And orchestrating that is almost impossible without great technology. And so we help you orchestrate those campaigns um, to these like ideal customers for you. So that's what we do. Awesome. And uh, what are you doing at Six Sense? So I'm the chief market officer at Six Sense. 
And what what does it entail? Just to summarize, because sometimes it's it, you, you can have, you can wear different hats, and it depends on the um, like how you fill out this role. So, how would you define what you're doing on a high level? So, I think there's three things. Um, one uh, to help understand the market: who is our ideal customer? What is our TAM? Um, what is the potential? Where is the potential for our solutions and helping, helping ensure that we point our valuable um, sales and market engine at, at the highest potential. Um, so that's, that's a big part of my job is understanding our market. The second big part of my job is brand or experience. And, you know, I wrote a, wrote a book on this. Um, you know, I feel that today, brands will differentiate themselves based on experience. And so how do we make sure that we are orchestrating an amazing experience for prospects and customers? Uh, so I spend a lot of time, you know, thinking through that, um, both digital experience as well as, you know, um, when we get back to in-person, in-person experiences and really designing those um, to be all centered around our, our buyers and buying teams. And then the last thing I do is I, um, I make sure we make money, right? So it's about revenue. And um, so I, I track our revenue operating model, which is um, you know all the way from that qualified account that I talked about that Sixth Sense shows us. So who's in market right now for what we do? How do we get accounts in market? And then how do we take in market accounts capture that demand, uh, successfully convert that, that demand and do it, you know, ideally fast and with a, a high, you know, ASP. So I'm always looking at that model and figuring out how we optimize it. So yeah. market experience revenue, that's what a chief market officer does. Yeah, that's what you are doing as a chief marketing officer. I, I think not not all of the CMOs are doing it right now. And that's also what we will uncover in our little conversation here. Um, that's going to be super interesting. And we'll also have a short look at what you wrote and what you did as a book later. Mm -hmm. um, so was there any aha moment um, that led you to shift your perspective on um, how marketing and customer acquisition should be done? Yeah, so I, um, you know, I've been at Six Sense now two and a half years, uh, but the company I was at before, I was there seven years, uh, and uh, which is, I guess, I, I I found out later, kind of rare. But um, but I, you know, when I started at Six Sense after being somewhere seven years, I felt like I didn't know what I was doing, um, and and there's. You look at that chart of MarTech and there's 8,000 different solutions and competitors and buzzwords and, you know, every day there was a new buzzword. Um, and I just was like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And, you know, did I choose the wrong, like, am I capable to, to really be the chief market officer at Sixth Sense? And so I was basically having having a inferiority uh, meltdown. <laughs> and um, my husband said, you got to play to your strengths. You got to play to your strengths. And I'm like crying. I'm like, I have no strengths. I don't know anything about anything. Ah! <laughs> you know, <laughs> Feeling sorry for myself, but you know, feeling sorry for us, ourselves is not going to get us anywhere. And I'm a big girl. So I put on my big girl pants and I said, okay, what are my strengths? And the last company I was at, again, seven years, was all about experience. And that was a direction that I helped lead us in, was to take cloud technology and really point that at customer and employee experience and how we re-architect that. And I believed, I mean, I believed in what we were doing there. I was a, a big part of it. And, and I said, you know, I really know that. I know it well. Um, how do I take what I what I learned and, and apply it here? And, and I had this aha moment because when I looked at all these little 8,000 different tools and buzzwords and whatever, it was all about us and our needs and not at all about a prospect who is a future customer. 
and their needs and how they want to buy. And they don't want to fill out a form. And they don't want to have a ton of spam in their inbox. And they don't want to get a bunch of irrelevant cold calls. And so I, I came into a meeting, we happened to be doing an offsite uh, and I had my, my marketing team and I said, you know what? We're sitting on this like amazing platform that has all this data and all these insights. If we can't figure this out, shame on us. And forget about the competition, forget about the buzzwords, forget about this, forget about that. We are going to prove that we can put prospects at the center of our, of our strategy and architect an, an experience with no forms, no spam, no cold calls, that being the goal, and, and perform exceptionally well. That's what we need to be able to prove. And so I called it Project Bold Moves. And, um, you know, it wasn't easy, but we learned a lot, we proved a lot. And so what I wanted to be able to do was kind of package all that up because I'm like, gosh, we're, I think we're on to something here. How do I package this up so that other marketers and sellers can kind of benefit from what we learned? And so that's what we did. Yeah, so that's where the book came out. No forms, no spam, no cold calls. Exactly. Um, can you can you tell us where, where we can find it? I will also put a link in the show notes later, but if someone is interested. Sure. So it's on it's on Amazon. Um, and you can get um, it's on Kindle and it's an audiobook. So if you really like listening to me talk, <laughs> you can get an audiobook um, as well as a physical book. Well, so you you recorded it yourself. That's cool. Well, I had I had help. I I worked with a, a publisher, but yeah. <laughs> oh, but that that's good. Um, so I mean, that's a provocative statement. I would say for most marketers, um, they would say, okay, without forms, without like, I mean, spam translated to mass emailing or no mass outreach and no code calls. What what should I do? Yeah. So um, why should why should someone stop using forms and mass outreach and code calls? So, well, I think the crux of what holds folks back from, from this is the MQL being the um, end goal of marketing, right? So if I waved a magic wand and I said, you don't have to worry about MQLs anymore. You don't have to worry about them. No one cares about them. But what I'm going to tell you in exchange, I'm going to take your MQLs away. But in exchange, I'm going to tell you ideal accounts that are in market for what you do right now. Now go off, right? And and what do you what do you do? Um, and so that's that's what we ended up doing is really, um, you know, I've never I've never worried or even tracked MQLs because I, I, I come from sales and sales has always been account-based. Like the number one reason a deal doesn't close or it, it, there's actually two reasons. One, it was just not the right time. Uh, and two was you were like single threaded. You were just working with one person and they didn't get buy-in that this was a big enough problem, a problem that needed to get solved. And so you're host, right? And so what we talk about is marketing needs to be looking at an account and a buying team and, and help market and multi-thread, you know, across the entire uh, process. Um, so I take away your MQLs. Mm -hmm. I tell you, but it's okay. I'm going to give you the in-market in accounts and I'm going to set you up on a process that allows you to track that and you can see buying stages so we can take care of your metrics. Like now, what do you do? And now put yourself in the shoes of your buyer, right? And you know, I'm Sammy, you probably buy technology for your company. I'm a CMO. I buy technology. And if I'm going to make a purchase, I'm not going to make a purchase willy nilly. I'm going to want to do research. I'm going to want to consume as much information as I can. 
to understand, you know, what is this and why am I doing it? And I've always been told that people hate to be sold, but love to be educated. So why would I not want to be the brand educating you? It just makes sense, right? So, hey, learn from me. Um, the other thing when you go to make a purchase, Sammy, is you're probably going to ask folks on your team that are actually going to use it. A lot of the things that we buy, I don't, I don't use. And so I'm going to want to make sure, do you, does this work for you? Does this work for you? Does it, how, how are we going to come together and really optimize this purchase? Right? So that's another thing you're going to want to do is, is make sure that, you know, everyone's getting educated on, on this purchase. Um, when it comes to emails, it might feel really good to send a bunch of emails and you do get maybe a small response. It feels like you're doing something. But the reality is for each of those small responses, there's all these people tuning you out. Um, you know, I think about my inbox. I've had to declare email bankruptcy three times. We send 300 billion emails a day. So what are you sending? Is it really worth sending? And I'm not saying don't send email, right? Email is still a medium, but are you sending it at the right time? Do, can, you, can you send something that's relevant because you really know what they're interested in? Um, and so I talk a lot about personaliza personalization, not, not, not being a parlor trick, but personalizing for relevance. And I think to personalize for relevance, you need to know their timing. You need to know what they care about. And you need to understand that in the context of their persona. And if you can put those three things together, it, send the email. But those are the three ingredients I think you need to be able to have um, to, to, to be able to, to make an email effective and, and adding value. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it comes to calls, again, and this, our head of sales was like, oh, we, people need to make calls, oh my God. You know, he was like freaking out about this. Um, and I said, I'm not like running around taking away people's phones. I just don't, I think it's kind of BS that marketing, we're crushing it on our MQL report and passing all these bogus things over. And so you and your team are looking at a cold list of accounts and having to go out and make cold calls. My responsibility is to warm those accounts up so that they're ready to take the call. Like that's my job. Um, and we still call, but again, it's calling. Do we know, is, is it the right time to call? Do we understand what they're looking to do so we can be educated and have a good conversation about something relevant to them? And, and can we connect that to their job? So their persona. So that those are some of the ingredients that we talk about for, you know, making a warm call, not a cold call. Um, and so those are the those are the things that we've we've set up. It sounds so easy, but I I imagine that's that was a hard battle to fight um, with these old habits. Um, so one thing I'm curious about because most um, marketing organizations are incentivized by MQS. And if you take that away, I mean, how do you incentivize your, your marketing team at six, at six, um, sorry. Six cents, it's six okay. Cents. <laughs> Too many calls today, six cents. Yeah. Um, um, so we create, we create pipeline quotas. And, um, and that's one, one thing that we do. And so what, what we do is we take each market segment because each market segment operates a little bit differently. And we study ASPs, cycle times and conversions. And we work backwards from the bookings number. Whoa. And this gives us a monthly quota for how much pipeline has to be created. Mm -hmm. And so I don't really care where it comes from, honestly. 
uh, it can come from marketing, it can come from channel partners, it can come from inbound, outbound. I, I don't care. Ultimately, I want to make sure that this month, this week, today, we are adding enough pipeline so that, you know, I think our, we're at like, I don't know, 75 days, 75 days from now for our commercial segment, they can make their number, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's, so, so that, what that creates is this operating model for each, you know, I talked about market. So for each market segment, I have this operating model and I have these quotas and I check that thing every day. And my team checks that every day. And what are we looking for? You know, is there enough qualified accounts to work? Because we know that every BDR can work about a hundred qualified accounts a month. So are we bringing enough qualified accounts in to get worked? Are those converting? How well are they converting? Are, are those numbers going down? What does our ASPs look like? Are those where they need to be? Um, what are our win rates look like? What's our competitive win rate? What's our upsell? And, and literally the chart is red, yellow, green. I'm a very simple woman. So I just want to know, are we red? And if we're red, I'm like, awesome. That's something I can go fix. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, Every, everybody on your team has a view on, on these numbers and key KPIs. Oh yeah. The whole company can see anytime. That is cool. I mean, that's also uncommon, um, but uh, but that's interesting. It reminds yeah, me a little bit of OKRs, but um, it's, it's really good. Yeah, I mean, that's that's running the business, and mm. then there's so that's part of it. So that's how mm. we run the business, and then there's changing the business because if you're in a high growth environment, you're always changing and improving. And so I use the V two Mom format for how every quarter we come up with the initiatives that we're gonna to do to change or improve the business. And so that's a process that, um, you know, I run with, with my team and we come up with a prioritized list of kind of initiatives that we're gonna get after. Um, and then the third component, so there's really three components to how I run the team. One is the operating model which is transparent, tracked. We know exactly where we're red, yellow, green. That's how we run the business and what I call future-proof our bookings. Two is there's always things, you know, if you're high growth, hey, partners, partner major initiative for us this year. So a lot of our V2 mom is about implementing new things around partners, right? Once it's implemented, then it just goes to the operating model. Um, and then the third piece is we actually build a go-to-market plan per quarter because I need to be able to tie out just saying I need to create $10 million this week. Okay, how am I going to create $10 million this week? Where is that going to come from? What are the specific campaigns we're going to run? So on a quarterly basis, we have this GTM plan that we tie out to make sure that we're doing all the right things to create the pipeline. Can you quickly explain what V2MOM means? Sure. So V2MOM is vision and values. That's the V2. Um, so what do we want to, what do we want to achieve in the next, and it's all time bound. So in the next year, what do we want to achieve? In the next quarter, what do we want to achieve? In just a simple sentence. Values is kind of like, what's the theme? Um, you know, how are we going to gut check ourselves? Um, and then mom are, is, um, method, owner, and metrics. So the mom is kind of like, this is what we're going to go and do, who owns it, um, and then how are we going to measure if we are successful with this or not. Okay, great. Thanks for clarifying. So it's a little bit similar to OKRs. Um, I see yeah. some aspects that are similar at least, yeah. Yeah, I think um, the mom part is OKR. Probably yeah, think yeah, about yeah. that. Um, it's just, it, it's all in the context of changing the business versus running the business. Yeah, that is true. That is the difference here. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Mm -hmm. um, well, we already talked a little bit about it, but let me ask you the question anyway. Um, in your perspective, how does and how will the role of uh, marketing and the CMO change? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I get the honor and privilege of talking to CMOs all the time. And um, it's, such an, it's such a diverse job um, and it's a misunderstood job uh, in a lot of cases. And so that's something that I'm like passionate about working on. And actually that's my next big, big project that I'm um, working on. And there's a, a group of, of CMOs that um, we've gotten together every year. They happen to all be women CMOs. Um, and we've gotten together every year and this idea of not a chief marketing officer, but a chief market officer has, has really spurned out of that group. And the need for CMOs to be less focused on the ing, meaning all of the activities that I do, the blogs, the website refreshes, the this, the that, um, and more focus on the market and unlocking and pen penetrating the market that we want to go and win and making sure that the, the company and the team is really pointed at the highest potential. Um, and so when you start to think like that, you know, things like knowing where in-market accounts are becomes important. Um, things like, it, it really makes you think more like an investor. So if you think about a VC or a PE, or even if you're going to go IPO, the first thing that they ask is not, are you a good company? The first thing they ask is, is there a market? for what this thing does. Because if there's no market, there's no company. Um, so really like making sure that you're devoting time, energy, care, and feeding to where is the market? Where is the highest potential? Because um, if you do that, the rest somewhat takes care of itself. Yeah, it's taking more on helicopter view looking at the strategic parts and um, i see a lot of um, cmos of smaller companies at least being more uh, fixed on the doing and, and less on taking the step back um, so that's interesting that's definitely something i didn't hear up to now so thanks for that um, let's take one step back um, and talk about how you how you shift away, like you talked about it a little bit, but um, basically, can you dig into how to implement this? No spam, no code calls, um, no forms in a company. If you if you're basically still in the old world, so right now I'm a CMO. Um, we see less and less a response to our code outreach. We want to change something, um, and I know that uh, I mean definitely everyone listening should should have a look at your book. I had a look at it, and uh, it basically is there's a playbook there. But uh, can you maybe summarize actionable things that uh, someone should start at, and and how how you can take it step by step to uh, to a better place that you described? Yeah, and hey, change is hard. It just is. Um, so I get it. Uh, I think the first step is to start to scorecard yourself based, like, like I think just getting away from the MQL gives you um, more latitude to change, right? So, so starting to build that pipeline, that, that operating model and those quotas, I think that's really an important step and saying, hey, I'm going to be my fiduciary responsibility is to look after this, not pass MQLs. Um, and then the second mindset shift I think is really important is the difference between working a lead and working an account. And so what I like to do is, um, first of all, just start to ask the question. So Sammy, what is the most efficient way so what is the most efficient way to double revenue and i'm gonna and there's two choices what is the most efficient way to double revenue mm -hmm. a double leads b improve 
marginally every single conversion, ASP and cycle times. Yeah, it's obvious. It, there is one right answer, okay? This is not everyone gets a trophy and thanks for playing, it's B. And so, you know, starting to say, okay, and that's not to say you can't have nothing coming in the top, right? We, we have to still build, you know, but that's where the market and the category design, because if there's a market and you're pointed your solutions at real problems, you're not creating demand, you're capturing demand. And you wanna capture that demand as efficiently as possible. And so just helping people understand that operating model and it's really your sales velocity formula and how marketing's job is to point the company at places where we can optimize that formula. And then saying, I get that we used to pass leads we're now going to pass an account. Why does that matter? Why is it different? A lead is a contact. We don't want to work contacts. We want to work accounts. So we want to work multiple contacts, right? Um, a lead is sometimes arbitrarily scored. Um, and it's either too early and they really just wanted the damn ebook, or it's too late. And they are hot inbounding and requesting a demo with us and all of our competition, right? So we wanna be more in this sweet spot of when they're and helping them understand, you know, how we're gonna work accounts in this sweet spot of when they're in market. And the definition of working an account is gonna be multiple contacts, multiple tactics, um, and so just getting that different lens focused is, I think, a good way to start the change. Mm -hmm. And OK, let's assume um, that is done. We, uh, we shifted. We got rid of the MQS. And um, how, can I, how can I imagine doing this in practice, especially also working with, with sales together? Because now uh, I think things change or might change a little bit between um, those two um, teams. Sales loves this because when you're in sales, the only asset you have is your time. The only asset you have is your time. And so you better choose it wisely. You better pick the right accounts to work. And so if I go to sales and I say, I am going to help you pick the right accounts to work so you don't waste your time and make sure you get to club, they will say, hallelujah. Um, because the reps that are always really, really busy and have tons of pipeline are not always the ones that make it to club. The ones that make it to the club are the ones that are, are strategic about picking the right accounts to work. And so and just, I'm going to help you refine your nose, right? And I'm going to help warm up accounts. So they're ready. They're ready to talk to you. So is there a certain tech stack that you definitely need to qualify or how do you do it? How do you qualify those accounts that are exactly at the right point? Yeah, so you need to be able to bring in, um, you know, so the, so the core of Sixth Sense is actually an embedded CDP and it brings in a lot of data. Um, and then we run predictive analytics on the data to be able to tell you um, based on patterns, based on buying patterns, um, where an account is in the journey. Um, so, you know, obviously that's ideal state. Um, we, I do know people that uh, just start to license, you know, various sources of intent data um, and start to use that. Um, you can just even start to de-anonymize your website. So there's things you can just put on your website. So at least you know who's on your website and you don't need to use a form, but you can still have that. Um, you know, so Six Sense and a, a account engagement platform like Six Sense, I think are the core of, of this type of stack. And then, and then it's about building out your experience. So I love conversational marketing platforms, for example, because they integrate really, really well and they help optimize the experience. Um, 
I love content hubs. Again, I want to be able to dynamically change a content hub based on you. And so, so then you can start to like trick it out, but it all starts to me with having the data. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's actionable even for smaller companies. Um, as you said, you don't have to be a super big company to do that. I mean, that's, that's something you can really start at the beginning. Um, engaging the right way is, is one question that I still have. So we, we, we go through these five steps you also outline in your book. The first one is selecting the best accounts, then know about them. I would say that's something you can find out and then engaging the right way. What is engaging the right way for you? So for us, um, it's a multi-tactic, so meaning multiple channels. What channels do you use? Um, so we use uh, display ads, we use LinkedIn, Facebook, you know, YouTube, um, it, it, you know, all kinds of different ways to, to engage. Um, and, but, but really what we've tried to do is, um, a lot of times you map your content to, you know, top of funnel, mid funnel, bottom of funnel, and what you want the prospect to do next. Well, because with the predictive analytics, I, you don't just have to put it all out there and guess. You know exactly where they are. That's one big benefit. But the second big benefit when it comes to engaging the right way is not thinking about what you want them to do, but what they have to do. What job do they need to do to move forward? And so there's this guy, Brent Adamson with Gartner, and he talks about buying jobs um, and really thinking, okay, if they wanna buy your solution, what, what are they gonna have to do? Who are they gonna have to convince internally? Um, what business case are they gonna have to put together? Uh, who else, you know, like really, really walking through their process. And then what we are aggressively doing is building almost a, like a digital buying center where we, we provide um, the calculator that they need, for example, to create the business case. We provide a sampling of our data so that they can, they can go and show sales. Look, these are all the accounts in market for what we do, right? So we're trying to think about how are they gonna need to be armed up to make this happen and move forward? And then what assets are we gonna provide to help them do that? It sounds so logical when you say it um, and so easy, but I would love to have uh, more companies do it like that because then we would get rid of all these uh, mass outreach and uh, everybody gets something tailored that you really might need at the right point of time. And then, yeah, it would be nicer um, <laughs> out there, definitely. Um, that's it with my questions. Um, I have five rapid fire questions uh, to wrap it up now. Awesome, um, let's do it. Rapid fire, baby. Um, and you can answer fast or slow, so no pressure. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, what do you do to keep body and mind fit and sharp? I don't know. Uh, I love to spin. I love spin class. Um, and I love projects. So like, like in the summer, I love doing yard work and, you know, and then in the winter, I love like doing design in my house and things like that. I just love that as a creative outlet. What's your favorite business book? You know, um, I read this book, Never Dine Alone, a long time ago. And I, I, I don't know why, I just really, I loved that book. I thought it was really, really good to think about networking and connecting and, um, you know, how to build your tribe, basically. Yeah, I read it too. I loved it too. I put it into the show notes. Um, favorite business leader you follow? Uh, my CEO. Why? 
he's because he's amazing. I mean, he's uh, <laughs> he's he's uh, I mean, that's why I came to Sixth Sense was to learn from him. He's like a go-to-market savant. Um, so obviously, I follow him. My old CEO is really good too. So I love learning and talking to him. Um, we are we have insight ventures as um, an investor and there's a really good operating partner there, Gary Service, who I work with a lot. Cool, thanks. Um, who should be our next podcast guest in your point of view? Next podcast guest. Hmm, so many good ones to choose from. Um, so I'm working with kind of a, co a cool company called My Planet, and um, their CEO, I think, is doing some really innovative things in the way of uh, commerce and experience, and I think he would be a great guest. Okay, I'll check it out and try to reach him. Um, and now you can directly address our audience and um, ask for anything. How can they help you? Oh, how can they help me? Yeah. Um, gosh check out Sixth Sense uh, would be great. I would love that. Um, check out the book. Uh, I'm always open to feedback on it. So, um, you know, send me messages in LinkedIn on how it's going and what you think maybe I missed or need to do better. Um, that would be great. Cool. So um, you maybe already answered it, but where can, where can or should people get in touch with you? LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Okay. So I put the LinkedIn uh, link to your profile also in the show notes. It well, was a pleasure having you as a guest, Latne. Uh, thank you so much. Really insightful. And um, yeah, it was, it was great. Hope to have you back you. in a couple of months or years. And let's talk about some different topics then. I'm sure you will fi find some, some new interesting ways to capture the market. Uh, so I, I'm going to track what you're doing at Sixth Sense. We're going to try. We're going to, we're, there's never a dull moment. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Bye. Cool.